to Jackson County Public Library. This is Bill Jamerson, and he's here tonight to tell us about the Civilian Conservation Corps. He comes from Northern Michigan. He's going to be singing, playing, showing a clip from his um, PBS film. PBS film, and reading some from his uh, book. And we are very excited to have him. And I'm very happy that you came here tonight. And we have a pin. Jackson County Public Library can present you. Thank you, Susie. Whatever you can use that, you can think of us. I will. I appreciate it. I'm concerned. Yeah. 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 Ye
I sorry, 2007, I wrote a novel about one of my buddies. He lived off the highway. I used to pick him up and take him to McDonald's for breakfast. Mike was his name. And after 12 years of developing this wonderful friendship, he had this iron trap memory, okay? He knew all the stories. Oh, so great. I said, I gotta write a book about you. So I did, I wrote a novel about him. So I'll read a couple excerpts for you from the novel. Uh, this is a loosely structured talk, and you're welcome to interrupt me if you have any questions on any subject, uh, take it a different direction, that's fine. Does anyone else out there have family in the seas, or relatives or friends that they might have had? You know, we all did. If you knew a World War II veteran, chances are they were in the seas. About, you know, half those war veterans were CCC boys. They were all over the place. And they didn't talk about it. And that's why I like to get out and do these programs, because it's like the war. For some reason, they just didn't talk about it. Um, a woman came to one of my programs. She was married to one for like 52 years. I said, can you tell me any stories he, he might have shared with you? No, he didn't talk much about it. But I do remember when he came back from camp and when he hugged me, I could feel his muscles from his chest. I gave a program this afternoon, or yeah, earlier in, in Kendallville, and a woman told me the same story. She said, yeah, this, uh, my neighbor boy came back. Boy, he was about 20 pounds heavier, big muscles. I didn't recognize him. You know, when they went to the camp, they were kind of slumped shoulder. The average weight was 138 pounds. When they came back, it was yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Well, they had meat on their bones. They had a spring in their step. Uh, it, it turned them into men. They were scrawny guys. Well, let's turn back the clock. It was March 1933. Franklin Roosevelt came into office with the promise of a new deal for the American people. His first major piece of legislation was the Emergency Conservation Works. And this gave employment to over 3 million 17 to 25 year olds. And this became known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. Civilian because they weren't in the Army, although the camps were run by the Army. They were Reserve Army officers. One fellow told me the first day of camp, the captain said, men, I'm here because I needed a job. You're here because you needed a job. I'm going to show you respect, but I want some respect in return. They all came from the same boat. Now, while the camps were run by the Army officers, the work projects were administered by the Park Service, the Forest Service, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, Soil, uh, oh, out west, what was it called? The Soil Conservation, not district, but uh, management, something. They, so they had different federal agencies. If they were building bridges or planting trees, depending on what the project was, determine who administered the work out there. But when they got back into the camp, they were in the hands of the Army. Now, the camps employed nationally over 200,000 Army officers and over a quarter million what they called local experienced men, LEMs, carpenters, stonemasons, bricklayers, cooks, lumberjacks, surveyors, architects. They were building airport landing strips and bridges and uh, shelters at, at state parks, so they needed experienced men. So when you go to a Versailles Park or Pocayman or Clifty Falls, you see these beautiful CCC built buildings. Trust me, they were built by artisans. Old world guys with very thick accents from Italy and Finland, stonemasons and, and old lumberjacks. But the CCCs would take those stones and face them and line them. The CCCs would cut down the trees and haul them over while the lumberjacks would, would hew them with their double bit axes, okay? That's why they're so beautiful. Where a WPA building, and I'll explain the WPA, were simpler structures. Those were built by average men. They used milled lumber, and the stonework was not as intricate. Now, the WPA, Workers' Progress Administration, was the other big work program. That gave employment to men over the age of 26 who lived at home and worked in the city. They built city streets, they repaired the city streets, they uh, repaired sewer lines, they built post offices, gymnasiums, uh, libraries. So they did projects in town and they were paid 15 cents an hour. The CCCs were these residential camps, they were way out in the boondocks. Uh, and uh, 
I met a fellow from Chicago who was shipped up to the Upper Peninsula. He said, we were happy up there. There was no, no stealing, no hunger, no crime. He said, the woods around our camp was like a cocoon, protecting us from the outside world. We were happy. His mother wrote him a letter, and she wrote how the neighbor had lost his job. Another neighbor had been evicted. His high school buddy was in jail. It was all bad news. He wrote her back and said, Mom, I can't write anything nice. Don't write it all. We don't want to hear about it. We were happy. One reason they were happy was good food. Oh, yeah. Good food. But I'll get to that later. You know, I was thinking. Yes. The CCC built the old Shields gym. But you're saying that they didn't do buildings like that. So maybe I'm confused. It was probably WPA. If it was a gymnasium, it was a probably WPA. I knew it was done during that period of time. There are exceptions, though. But I was thinking there was at one time a sign in that building that said it was built in the CCC. It may have. Um, I'll tell you why. In Indiana, the CC camps were located close to town because the primary work projects were on the farms. They wanted it central. So they may have said, hey, can you guys give us a hand on this, this gym? And they may have built it. We're up in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The camps were way out in the boondocks because they were building roads and planting forests, you see. So, you know, when you have a camp a mile from town, they may have just say, hey, give us a hint to your guys and let's build a gym. Could have happened. And the converse is also true. The CCC's built all the state parks, right? They built 800 state parks in the United States. So you think, well, every state park is CCC, right? Well, no. The WPA built some parks. I ran into one up in uh, uh, Minnesota last fall. So there are always exceptions out there. By the way, nationwide, there were over 3 million CCs in, in 47 states. And uh, from 1933 to 1942. And there were about 60,000 here in Indiana during that nine year period. Anyway, a young man named Clyde Kilgore from Nebraska wrote a little song I'd like to share. And I love this song because it was written by a teenager. What grade are you in, young lady? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Imagine a teenager writing this song. From hills and plains throughout all the land, people are singing a joyful refrain. Smiling and working, merry youthful band, till happy days are here once again. With joyful voice, we all rejoice for C, C, C. Up to the skies, our praises rise for our great country. We believe this land of the free is on the road to prosperity. Hip hip hooray for the NRA, Franklin DM, CCC. Hip hip hooray! Well, the NRA, of course, stands for the National Recovery Act, and that was the umbrella organization which included all these alphabet soup agencies. Uh, my program today is not a blanket endorsement of the NRA. The economic policies of Roosevelt were pretty much a failure. It doesn't really matter what political side of the spectrum you were on. Uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, for example, in 1933, imposed regulations on businesses. It covered over 2,000 categories of businesses. And it basically dictated how many hours you could have an employer work, what you had to pay them, and what you charge as far as a price for a product. And it had a very detrimental effect to the free market economy, what was left of it. My favorite example was a tailor in New York City who was arrested and put in jail because he charged a client 35 cents to iron a suit of clothes. And the official price, NRA price, was 40 cents. So 
So you can imagine this covering all types of aspects, you know, from the utilities to manufacturing to services. The National Industrial Recovery Act caused the national gross production to decline by 25% in its first year. It was ruled illegal by the Supreme Court on a very famous day in March by a verdict of nine to nothing. <laughs> I mean, he was just breaking every law in the book trying to create what we call a command economy. And there were failures. But the desire to help your fellow man is never wrong. And that's what the WPA and the CCC was about. And they were good programs. And they helped young men who really were at the end of their rope with no other options. And so that's what we're celebrating today. Uh, the farm boys, they had a little bit of food, but they had no money. If you were a city boy, the, the jobs went to the dads who had children. They gave preferential treatment. If you had three children, you got the job. If you were 19 years old and single, forget it. Now, job number one in Indiana was working with the farmers. The farmers were in bad shape. They had over farmed the land, erosion, gullies out there, fertilizer. What's fertilizer, you know? It was just uh, uh, very low crop yields. So what the CCCs would do is they'd send a dozen fellows out to Farmer Jones and 10 guys out to Farmer Smith. And, and whatever the, the needs were, they would work with that farmer. You know, it's like having a SWAT team come in and help your crew, you know? You've got a big washed out gully. Farmer doesn't have time to repair that. You got a dozen guys out there, they would plant black locust trees because they grew like weeds and they'd repair those gullies. They would terrace hills, you know, create notches so, so the rain wouldn't erode them. If the farmer bought the barbed wire, the CCs put it up for free. If you had 20 bucks, they'd build a nice outhouse. These were prefabricated outhouses on a nice concrete foundation. Pretty good deal. Let's say you had a, a, a river, a creek going through. There's a lot of erosion. Well, they put riprap. That's like broken rock. And they plant grass along those, that, that, uh, those eroded areas. And if, if the stream was so big, powerful, that it was eroding the bank, why well, they would put in what they call wing dams. Now, these are dams underneath the surface of the water. And they would redirect the current so it wouldn't wash out those, those slopes. Well, maybe you needed a bridge on your river. You know, you haul your, your, your hay across, right? Well, they build you a bridge or a dam. So uh, all kinds of projects were involved. And they were crushing limestone for fertilizer. It's a big thing for farmers. Was, how many of you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Was it typical for, uh, for example, with the group that my dad was in in Milan, they went out west like that. Was it typical to move these guys okay. rather than have, because I think there was a three C's camp here in Brownstown. Good question. The, the, the question is, uh, was it typical that they were sent out of state? I've never run into a hard fast rule on how that was, decision was made. But I can tell you a few observations I've made over the years. If you were from a rough neighborhood in Chicago, they shipped you far away, the upper peninsula of Michigan, Utah, Idaho, so that if you decided to come back, you were allowed to leave voluntarily. You signed up voluntarily, you could leave. They made it hard. You thought twice because you were going to have to hitch a ride on a bunch of trains, and those train dicks had billy clubs, and they'd come out and whap you. Okay? So if you're from, now if you were a farm boy from Indiana, they knew, you knew how to work because you were doing a man's job at 12 or 13. Did you know that? By the time you were 12 or 13, you were working 10-hour days. You were a man. You weren't a man, but you were doing man's work. Now, as I understand it, they gave a choice to a lot of these fellows. And they said, well, we have got a camp here 30 miles here. You can go home on the weekend. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay here. I'm going to go stay close to home. Or you got a chance to go see the Grand Canyon. I want to go to the Grand Canyon, you see. So if you were a good, hard-working kid, and they knew you were going to make it, they'd say, where do you want to go, kid? You know. Take your pick, Washington State or Indiana. So I think that's played into the hand. They shipped a lot of boys from the Appalachians, moonshiners out west, because a lot of them were good with cars and have a history of working with those cars out there down the moonshine territory. You know, and uh, 
lot of them were shipped out west. Uh, I met a fellow from Georgia. He said he was running a moonshot still at the age of 12. He ran away from his father when he was nine years old. His father came back from the First World War, loaded up a shrapnel, and the guy was an alcoholic. I mean, you know, just to kill the pain. He took it out on the sun. The sun ran away. He lived in the woods all summer. He's like catching catfish. His, his aunt sent him to live with his, his cousins, the Baileys, and he was running a moonshine still at the age of 12 by himself. Don't think about that, Don. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, think about it. <laughs> at the age of 16, his aunt came out and rescued him, signed him up for the CCCs. And he said when he signed up, he had, what's my last name? You see, he'd run away from home. He, they called him Jimbo his whole life. He didn't know his last name. He was 16 years old. He said when he showed up for the seas, all the guys at the bus stop were barefoot. Oh, yeah. When those guys, a lot of them came from the sticks. They didn't know. When they would issue them toilet kits, they'd get a toothbrush and they'd brush their eyebrows. They didn't know what a toothbrush was for. And, uh, you know, what's it under my, my, my blanket? That's called a sheet. What's a sheet? What's that for? You know? Some of them had never taken showers. They'd, they'd have to physically drag them into the shower and scrub them out with lye soap because they, these guys had never had showers. They really came from incredible backgrounds. By the way, when they came in, they would throw their clothes away because they were so ragged. And they issued them new clothes, boots, shoes, socks, underwear. Imagine that. New shoes. Boy, oh boy, it was a big deal. Um, Anyway, I kind of lost my track. Oh, I was going to tell you about the, how many of you heard of Elwood? Yeah. This is from the Elwood Call Leader, uh, April 1936. Frank Poole, engineer at the Frankton CCC camp, has arranged.